This is Ag Matters PM from the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network, brought to you by the Iowa Soybean Association. Your daily recap of the information that affects Iowa's farmers, producers, and consumers, right here in the heart of the heartland. With reports from our award-winning broadcast team of Dustin Hoffman and Riley Smith. Now, from the IARN studios in Des Moines, here's Dustin Hoffman. Good day, everybody, and welcome to Ag Matters PM from the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network. I'm Dustin Huffman. Today's Tuesday, May the 10th, 2022. Coming up in today's show, Riley Smith will be talking with Greg McBride of Allendale as they look at what's going on with the crop conditions and the weather in South America. And I talk to Iowa Renewable Fuels Association Executive Director Monty Shaw. But first, let's take a look at those markets. It's time now for the Ag Matters PM Closing Market Summary, your source for market analysis and settlement prices from the day's trade in Chicago, courtesy of the folks at agmarket.net. Well, we're at the end of Tuesday's trading day, and we're going to see how things panned out. And for that, we turn to Matt Bennett of agmarket.net. Matt, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm, doing, I'm doing good. How are you doing, bud? We're hanging in there trying not to melt here in central Iowa. Is that what it's looking like out there for you guys in Illinois, too? Yeah, it sure has gotten warm on us awfully quickly. You know, it's been cool and wet all spring, and a lot of folks have been frustrated with the lack of uh, uh, ground drying up, you know. And then a couple guys in my office this morning talking about, man, they're worried about the ground baking, uh, you know, and maybe actually getting a bit of a crust on it, even though uh, we never really got a beaten rain around here. We've had a lot of wind, a lot of heat, a lot of sun over the last day or two. You know, and so some of that stuff that was planted here a week, uh, uh, seven, eight days, nine days ago, uh, might struggle to make it through. So uh, they might actually be asking for a shower by the end of the week. So how did the uh, corn and soybean markets fare here today uh, with all the weather and everything that's been going on here in the Midwest? Well, first of all, better than yesterday. You know, yesterday was a pretty rough go. You know, there's no question that uh, a lot of folks were sitting here before you know your your uh, planning progress was released you know during the trading session hey you know what it's going to be a good week weather's going to be uh, solid going to get a lot of crops in the ground maybe stave off some of those thoughts that there's going to be a massive prevent plant and so on and so forth you come in uh, for corn at 22 percent when i believe a lot of folks were thinking more like 30 percent you know and then soybeans as well but below what most people were thinking, you know, and then the, the overnight trade comes in and, and essentially uh, you reward uh, the market with a little bit of premium. Now, you know, on the closing basis, it's not like we rallied through the roof by any means, but we certainly kind of took back some of those losses from yesterday and uh, made us feel a little bit better going home here on Tuesday. So what kind of things, is it mostly just the weather and the planning progress right now that the markets are keeping an eye on or are there other outside factors as well? Yeah, there's no question that uh, the weather in Brazil, parts of Brazil in really good shape, parts of Brazil are not. Uh, There's certainly some dryness issues. That forecast continues to flip-flop, similar to what we see uh, in our part of the world whenever we get into pollination and beyond. Uh, You look at what's going on as far as uh, uh, demand front, you know, and there's no question that uh, everyone's watching to see if any of these pullbacks uh, maybe surface some export business. And so, uh, this morning or today, I guess the trade, if you look at it, we kind of unwound the bull spread just a little bit here in corn. You know, whenever you look at, uh, for instance, the July SEP, uh, July was up three and three quarters, whereas SEP was up six. Now, those are not settlement prices. Those are the closing prices that I saw, uh, you know, whenever you and I were speaking. But uh, that tells me that anytime you see the bull spread really uh, taking place, uh, you've got to think the buyers are uh, really out there aggressive. Uh, so today is a little bit surprising as we rallied uh, to see uh, the bulls bread and wine just a little bit. Now in uh, livestock, I know cattle and hogs have both been on some shaky ground the last couple of days. How did they turn out today? Uh, you know, uh, fats were down over a dollar. Uh, the feeders were down a couple bucks. You know, you've got to expect whenever you see your feed stocks go up. Uh, that there's a chance you could see uh, feeders go down. Now, front month hogs were actually up just a shade, but for the most part, 
uh, your proteins kind of took it on the chin. Nothing uh, extravagant like we've seen at times, but uh, there's no doubt that uh, it's expensive to feed these animals right now. Everyone knows it. And so whenever you get in up in some of these levels yesterday, you know, you got a little bit of a relief factor. And I think people felt a little bit better uh, about what it was going to cost to uh, uh, put pounds on some of these animals. But uh, you come in today again and uh, you're back to a little bit of a rally action. And, of course, coming up on Thursday, we have the WASD report. Uh, Matt, I'm going to ask you to look into your crystal ball and tell us what you expect to see coming out of that report. Yeah, you know, i got to think that moving forward, old crop stocks on soybeans could be extremely tight. I do think that you're going to have to slash your carryout uh, for old crop beans. Probably going to have a chance to slash in a little bit on corn as well. But the big thing to look for you know, is we're going to actually plug in the acres from the March 31st planting intentions into the balance sheet for this year. Uh, typically what the USDA does is they use the demand calculations uh, that comes from the outlook forum. So uh, we all pretty much know kind of where things might come in, uh, but we got to figure out, you know, what is the carry in going to be, which is this this current year's carry out. So uh, there's no doubt that a lot of folks are expecting some friendly numbers. Uh, anytime you get a lot of folks looking at it that way, you're uh, certainly subsequent to uh, uh, something happening if, if it's a little bit of a bearish report. But uh, at this stage of the game, I think until we get this crop in the ground, there's a whole lot going on with the market that's going to keep a, a fairly good underpinning under this market. All right, Matt. Well, if anybody out there wants to talk about what's going on in the in the markets and maybe strategize accordingly, how do they get in touch with all of you at agmarket.net? Yeah, just that, agmarket.net, agmarket.app. Either one of those places you can go get our research, our contact info, and uh, see some of the cool technology that we provide to try to help producers be able to uh, not only identify, but lock in some of their uh, uh, net income levels and uh, uh, profit on return and whatnot. All right. Well, Matt, we thank you so much for the insight and look forward to talking to you again real soon. Absolutely. Thank you, bud. That again was Matt Bennett of agmarket.net. Let's take a look at the closing prices brought to you by the folks at Bar Chart. July corn was up three and a quarter at 775 and a quarter. December up eight and a quarter at 719. July beans up seven at 1592 and a quarter. November up eight at 1454 and three quarters. Soy meal down a dollar thirty at 40150. Soy oil up a buck thirty at 8104. Chicago wheat unchanged at 1092 and three quarters. Minneapolis wheat up six and three quarters at 1213 and a half. Kansas wheat up ten and three quarters at 1175 even. Oats for July down 16 and a quarter at 599 and a quarter. August live cattle down a buck twenty-seven at one thirty-four ten. August feeders two thirty-seven lower at one seventy-one eighty-five. Lean hogs up twenty-seven cents at one hundred one fifty-seven. Pork cutouts down sixty-seven cents at one hundred seven sixty-two. And class three milk eleven cents lower at twenty-four sixty-six. And that's been your Ag Market Recap here on Ag Matters PM. We're going to take a short break and hear from our sponsors, the Iowa Soybean Association and the Soy Checkoff. And then when we come back, Riley Smith travels south of the equator to see what's going on in South America. This is Ag Matters PM. Iowa Soybean Association is driven to deliver for Iowa's 40,000 soybean farmers. We're proud to provide objective agronomic research, a helping hand with soil and water stewardship, and timely industry news powered by the Soybean Checkoff. Learn more at IASoybeans.com. Welcome back to AMPM from the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network. I'm Dustin Huffman. Well, it's time now for another update on South American weather and crop conditions. And for that report, we turn to Riley Smith. Well, the dry weather has decided to stick around in South America for the time being. Of course, that can be a good and a bad thing. It's not so great for Brazil safrina corn, but it is helping with harvest progress. Allendale commodity broker Greg McBride said the weather right now is a bit of a double-edged sword. Well, it's looking dry. Uh, so uh, continued uh, concerns about that uh, second crop uh, corn in uh, in Brazil. But uh, we should be uh, getting very, uh, very good harvest progress for both uh, the last of the uh, the early crop in uh, in Brazil and then the uh, the Argentine crop as well. So it's uh, it's kind of a uh, a dual uh, dual edged sword there. Uh, we need to see the uh, the rain come in for that uh, second crop corn to help finish that out. Uh, and they're not getting it, but they are going to be able to, to finish their harvest here fairly soon. Due to its climate, it always seems like the crops in South America are all constantly in different stages of the growth cycle. As such, the current weather is both good and bad for the crops down there. McBride said the dryness will help the soybeans get out of the field, but it could be harmful to Brazil's safrina corn. 
which is where most of their corn production comes from. The biggest thing right now is is obviously finishing out that second uh, crop corn. That is a big uh, uh, a big uh, deal for them. Uh, that is where the bulk of their corn uh, production comes is from that second crop. Um, so that is that is a concern that should be supportive to prices. We've got other factors in the markets that are kind of uh, weighing us down right now, but um, that is something that uh, it won't be as big of a deal. It won't be a big deal for for beans. Uh, it's obviously with Argentina as well uh, harvesting at this point. Um, you know, just having clear skies for them to to harvest under is is going to be a big deal just to get to get things finished because they want to get it out uh, before they see any major uh, uh, frost or freezes uh, uh, that could uh, lead to maybe some shatter or anything like that. But uh, as far as anything, their crop is is made now. It's just a matter of getting it in. McBride also provided a crop progress update for Brazil and Argentina. So Brazil, uh, with their soybean harvest, is at 96%. Uh, they are basically uh, in the bin at this point. Uh, uh, on the five-year average, they're about 98%. So they are just a little bit behind. Uh, some of that uh, was attributed to some of the uh, some of the rainier uh, times that they had uh, back a, a month or two ago. Now they've uh, kind of caught up to it. Uh, on the corn side of things, foreign, their first corn uh, harvest is at 89%. That's in line with the five-year average. That's in line with where they were at last year. So um, they're right on schedule. These, some of these drier days will give them an opportunity. Some of that southern uh, corn that uh, is a little bit later in that first crop uh, will probably uh, still need to need some time, but they, they should be able to get that done here over the next week or two. Yeah, Argentina on their soybeans uh, uh, at 63%, moving right along, 5% uh, percent ahead of the five-year average. They're ahead of the uh, of last year's pace by 10%. So really moving along uh, along well, like we talked about with the uh, the weather, the drier weather gives them an opportunity to get out there and be uh, be uh, extremely active on the uh, on the harvest side of things. And you're seeing that uh, uh, reflected in the uh, in the soybeans on the corn. Basically the same thing. They're ahead of where they were last year. They're about 5% ahead of where they were last year. This year they're at 37%. Uh, and they're just slightly behind the five-year average. So their focus right now is getting the uh, getting the soybeans out. Uh, they'll uh, shift their focus to, uh, to corn uh, uh, really over the next uh, week or two. But uh, uh, as far as anything, moving right along and, and where they need to be uh, based off of, uh, uh, historicals uh, for, their, uh, for their harvest progress here. Recently, we've seen the grain market start to turn lower. This isn't necessarily a huge cause for concern yet, as there are still plenty of outside influences that are contributing to this trend. McBride said it's good to be cautious, but we should try to be moderate with our concerns. Yeah, I mean, it's just uh, looking at the the markets you're seeing, obviously, over the last uh, uh, four or five days, you've seen the markets take a uh, distinctive uh, turn lower. Uh, we need to uh, be a little bit moderate uh, with our concern about that. Obviously, there are other factors in there. We've got the economic factors with the uh, rate hike uh, by the Fed. Um, you've got the, the crude oil uh, backing off of its highs by six to ten dollars. So you need to uh, you need to monitor that but i don't think it's time for a panic sell just yet uh the concern that we do have when it comes to this uh, this crop here is not necessarily that it's not going to get planted we think that it will get planted there's no uh, no real main con major concern there it's going to be once we get into june july august weather and right now we're looking at La Nina uh, weakening a little bit, but that Pacific Decadal Oscillator uh, is still in a negative phase, which puts uh, uh, puts more uh, heat into the forecast and still keeps that uh, keeps that precipitation low. So that is a situation where uh, some of these drought areas from last year could actually see widening uh, of that net and get it more into Iowa, get it into Illinois, Missouri, uh, and other parts of the Midwest, and that could. Not necessarily mean that we're going to have a failure of a crop, but could give us a reason to see some uh, some premium put back into this market as we uh, turn the corner into uh, uh, into the later spring, into uh, late May and early June. That again was Allendale Commodity Broker Greg McBride. For the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network, I'm Riley Smith. Thanks, Riley. Now let's take a look at that ag weather outlook. Sun in the clouds have played tug of war over Des Moines most of the day. In fact, sunshine was variable depending on where you were located in the state. 
Now, we still have a slight risk of some thunderstorms coming up tonight and into tomorrow. Let's see what the National Weather Service has in store for the next 24 hours. Again, we saw some early morning thunderstorms, but nothing really too strong. And the clouds started to break up with some sunshine and highs from the mid-70s in the northwest to the low 90s in the south part of the state. Now tonight we're going to see variably cloudy skies with some slight chances of thunderstorms across the northeastern part of the state. Lows will be anywhere from the upper 50s to the upper 60s. And then tomorrow will be variably cloudy skies depending on what area of the state you're in. But there will be a slight chance of some afternoon thunderstorms and highs in the upper 80s to the low 90s. Looking at the affiliate weather map, as we can see, we're going to have that chance for sunshine to start the day and those p.m. thunderstorms. Cherokee will be coming with 87 degrees for a high. Shenandoah and Des Moines around 93. Albia close by at 92. 88 up in Waterloo and 90 will be the temperature over in Clinton for tomorrow. For more detailed forecasts in your area, tune to your local Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network affiliate. That's been a check of our Ag Weather Outlook. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, I'll be talking with Iowa Renewable Fuels Association Executive Director Madi Shaw. This is Ag Matters PM. As we approach planting season, make sure you stay safe and share the road with your local farmers. Slow-moving tractors with large planters occupy a lot of space on the road, so stay patient and follow at a distance of around 50 feet. You should never, ever try to pass them at a bridge, intersection, hill, or curve. It's far better than putting yourself or someone else at risk. So please, stay safe and remember to tip your hat to your local farmer this planting season. This message was brought to you by your friends at the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network. Welcome back to AMP. I'm from the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network. I'm Dustin Huffman. Recently, we talked with Mahdi Shaw, the Executive Director of the Iowa Renewable Fuels Association, about several issues pertaining to biofuels and Iowa. One of them being a letter that Governor Kim Reynolds joined with Midwestern governors across eight states to talk to the EPA about a little known caveat in the Clean Air Act that it gives governors authority over when E15 can be sold. Here's what we had on that discussion with Mahdi Shaw. And that was the next thing I was going to bring up. I know Governor Reynolds and has, has worked with a few governors of other states. And, you know, they're, they're talking about the fact that obviously the Midwestern states uh, have a lot of stake in ethanol, but also see the benefits of it and are, are really petitioning the administration to do something about making this E15 uh, being able to be year round again, permanent once again. Yeah, I mean, we've really said that this has been an April. I know we're in May now, but th this has been an April to remember. Um, first of all, you know, we got the Iowa Biofuels Access Bill over the finish line with the leadership of Governor Kim Reynolds and, and strong bipartisan support in the legislature. Secondly, Joe Biden's stepped up and said, hey, we're not going to take E15 away from consumers in the summer of 2022. We're going to do an emergency declaration that has now happened. And we're going to keep E15 as an option during the summer of high gasoline prices, which we really needed. Um, and then third, and quite frankly, probably the most significant going forward, uh, even though I'm not sure it's gotten the attention that it deserves, is eight states came together. Again, I would argue led by Governor Reynolds, but lots of governors were involved in this and we appreciate them all. Um, eight states uh, came together and are actually going to exercise the governor's authority under the Clean Air Act to put in place a permanent fix for E15. Under the Clean Air Act, it allows governors to request that E10 and E15 be regulated the same. Once we regulate them the same, we can sell them year round because E15 was never restricted in the summer. It's just that when it had different regulations than E10, what would the oil guys do? They'd send up the gasoline that you could blend and make E10 and it'd meet the standard. But if you use that same gasoline for E15, it wouldn't meet E15's different, tighter standard. And so it basically allowed the oil guys to game the system and prevent E15 from being sold. So now in these eight states, you're going to have a year round permanent solution for not just E15, but any ethanol blend going forward. We hope this is the start of something that other states will look at. This is a nice tight group of upper Midwestern states. We want to branch out from there because not just every Iowan deserves access to that lower cost fuel. So does every American. So it's been a, it's been a, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years and this is one of the most exciting months uh, I've had. Usually when I get this much media attention, it's for bad news. So it's kind of fun to be able to come on here and, and, and so, we, you know, we've talked mostly about E15 in this bill, which is the focus because that's, you know, most people drive gas cars and, and that sort of thing. But this bill also creates 
a first ever incentive in Iowa for B20. And I think the first ever incentive anywhere for a blend above B20, we actually have that next step up B30. Now, we don't think we're going to see a lot of B30 right away uh, as we work through some of the technical challenges. But this is Iowa saying, hey, we're not done yet. You know, we're not done on the biodiesel side. We're not done on the ethanol side. Well, E15 is the next step. It's certainly not going to be the last step that we need to do to keep growing markets for our farmers because they keep producing more more commodities. So, you know, getting back to the, the letter that was sent and the eight governors that are exercising that right, obviously, we know in history, it's not going to take long for big oil to challenge that. And of course, it's it's right there in the in the Clean Air Act. You know, what what do you think the the, the challenges are going to come? And what, what how do you think we are able to overcome some of those challenges, maybe? Yeah, I mean, the one thing that we all know is that uh, the, well, first of all, let me tell you what I think will happen. I think the EPA will approve these because the Clean Air Act in this area is pretty, pretty basic. It says a governor has the right to make this request. And if they make this request and submit uh, credible data showing a clean air, uh, uh, an emissions improvement, then the EPA shall grant that request. And, and based on conversations that people have already had with the EPA, I mean, that's, it's a clear reading. Number one. Number two, other states have already done this. Uh, actually, back in the 90s, um, and, and uh, usually back then it was for anti-ethanol reasons, but I, you know, that's a technical thing that's changed over the last 30 years. I, I don't want to bore you with unless you have about a half hour. But, but the bottom line is other states have already exercised this authority and it's held up, uh, and these states have submitted data. When you lower the emissions, excuse me, when you lower the volatility of fuel, you lower the emissions. That's the whole premise of any clean gasoline program. So that's what we're doing here. We're lowering the volatility of the fuel, equalizing them out so they're regulated the same. And in doing so, you can sell either fuel year round. It's going to lower emissions. The data has been done. The models have been run. And that's what, you know, not surprisingly, that's what the data showed. It's what it had to show. That's that's how the, how the science works. So these will be approved, I feel very confident. Then I feel very confident that big oil will sue. Because when you have the deep pockets of big oil, you sue on everything. You never know when you'll get some judge that that uh, doesn't do their job very well. Now, as far as what will happen after that, I'm less certain. Because I was really surprised that big oil won the lawsuit against year-round E15, the nationwide year-round E15 rule that the EPA had put out back under the Trump administration. Um, I still think it was an inaccurate and very narrow reading of the EPA's authority under the Clean Air Act. But that's that's what we're dealing with today. Here, because of the past precedents and everything, I feel like we're on pretty solid ground. There are other things that the uh, that refiners can try to do. They can try to claim under the Clean Air Act, well, we need to delay this because we simply can't produce enough of it. And I think that's going to be very interesting for them. I think uh, by the time they make that claim, a, a guy named Chuck Grassley might be holding the gavel of the Senate Judiciary Committee that looks over antitrust issues. And I think for the entire oil industry to say we can't produce more low volatility gasoline would take collusion. And so I think it'll be a very slippery slope for them to go down that road. Uh, we also can look at history. Um, in the past, in the let's say around 2005, uh, when we had higher gasoline demand and we had more areas of the country in the, the what's called reformulated gasoline programs, the clean gasoline programs, they actually produced many, many thousands of barrels a day more low volatility gasoline back in 2005 than would be needed today to meet the current demand plus the new demand that will come from these eight states. So for them to argue we can't do it, it's like you've already done it in the past. And so um, they're going to try and we're going to see, but we, we feel like we're on pretty solid ground here. And that again was Iowa Renewable Fuels Association Executive Director Marty Shaw. And just like that, we've reached the end of Ag Matters PM from the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network. You can find all our content online at iowaagnet.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and find all our video products as well as past episodes of AMPM on our YouTube channel. You can also check out our free twice daily market podcast through Google, Apple, Amazon, Spotify, and Podbean. From the IARN studios in Des Moines, I'm Dustin Huffman. For Riley Smith, we thank you for watching. This has been Ag Matters PM.